Hey, this is Randy, the Swiss Frog Guy, and this video is all about finishing and painting this spray polyurethane foam tree that I made. And if you didn't catch the first two installments of this video series, go back and check those out. I show exactly how I made the basic tree structure, installed the heat mat on top, the light inside, and then in the second issue, I show you how exactly I cast this bark from a real tree using silicone rubber. I was really happy with how my tree was coming along. At this point, I had achieved almost all of my goals. I had made a hide, there was a place to bask on top with a heat mat, and there was even a light inside. What was left was finishing it correctly. The tree was still out of raw foam, so it was pretty delicate. I needed a covering that was gonna be waterproof and durable, safe, and of course, realistic and cool looking. The inside was the least visible spot, so I decided to start there. I chose to work with Drylock because it's non-toxic, it colors really easily, and there are tons of examples of people using it online. I went with the white version of Drylock because then I could tint it as I wanted. At first I used Quickcrete cement colors, but you can also tint it with any non-toxic paint. I found Drylock to be pretty thick stuff, so it's important to kind of dab it into the pores instead of brushing it on the surface. But even doing so, I found I spent a lot of time just trying to fill in pores. Diluting with water helped a little with this, but I found adding too much water just made the grit fall out of solution. Dry luck is pretty much like latex paint with sand in it, so it's multiple layers and that grit that makes it super strong. I find that dry luck hardens very thick. It's that thickness that gives it strength, but it's also what hides details. Since I had spent so much time molding this bark, I wanted to treat it completely differently using epoxy. I'll explain more about that in the next part of this video. Between coats, I went over certain areas very carefully with spackle to try to even out the differences between foam that had been carved, which had open pores, and foam that wasn't carved, which was kind of slippery and smooth on the surface. I didn't want to hide all the details with more and more layers of Drylock, and plus, Drylock isn't available in Switzerland, so I had to have mine sent all the way from the States, which was super expensive. It was a bit of extra work and I had to sand between coats, but in the end, it worked pretty well. At this point, I figured it would be a good idea to check to see if the tree actually fit into the terrarium. I had made a 3D model of my tree before I even got started, but I found that sometimes ideas and reality don't always match, especially when you work with foam. Enter the concept of beautiful kludging. Which, of course, is the fine art of pretending you meant to do it that way the whole time. In this case, it meant I needed to cut the back so it would be flat against the back of the terrarium and also lop off one of the roots. And because I was feeling particularly inspired, I used a blowtorch, which wasn't a good idea. With the back cut flush, now I could see exactly where the tree would sit in the terrarium and I could cut the roots to match. It was kind of heartbreaking to chop up my tree like this, but my goal was ultimately to make the tree look like it actually grew in the terrarium. Ever since I was a little kid, I always loved those exhibits in the zoos where there is a rock or a tree or some water that just butted right up against the glass as if you had taken a slice of nature and just beamed it into the zoo. So using a piece of sheet foam as a guide, I tried to adjust the tree accordingly. This way I could trim on all sides of the tree and remove the guide whenever I needed to. It worked pretty well and I was able to get the side of the tree almost straight. To fill in the very last gaps, I'd need to use some spray foam. So I pulled out the tree again, protected everything with plastic wrap, and installed a guide. But this time, I used a piece of glass. Even though the glass guide was a lot heavier than the foam, I didn't need to pull it on and off so often. And plus, with the foam, I needed to be able to see what I was doing. I wanted to be able to remove the tree in the future, so I carefully masked off all areas that I didn't want foam to stick to, and I got to spraying. Spray foam can put out a surprising amount of force as it expands. It can push pieces out of place and distort others. So this gap filling had to be done very slowly. I often worked from both sides to compress the foam and reduce how much it expanded. All this gap filling wasn't just for looks though. By knowing exactly where the tree was going to sit in the terrarium, I could build the background separately with full confidence that it would all fit together at the end. 
Now that the tree was cut exactly to the right shape and I was sure it was going to fit into the terrarium, it was time to finish the bark. Right now this is very, very sensitive. Just like when I finished the inside of the tree, I wanted to harden the structure, I wanted to make it waterproof, but differently, I wanted to make sure I preserved all the details of the bark. So this time, instead of using dry lock, I used two-part epoxy. Because of the nature of the casting process, the bark actually has a skin on its surface. So as an experiment, I tried dusting the wet epoxy with a little bit of plaster of Paris. It wouldn't react with the epoxy, but maybe it would strengthen the surface. I was pretty concerned that I might have completely destroyed my tree, but it turned out okay. Not only did it strengthen the surface, it trapped the running epoxy before it had a chance to cure, and importantly, it showed me exactly where I needed to put the next coat. I then set the tree aside for several days to let the epoxy cure completely. After several days in a warm room, the tree was totally cured and ready for painting. I decided to go with the dry brush technique because I thought it would give me the most realistic results. Using non-toxic acrylic paints, I first covered the entire tree with a dark undercoat. I worked carefully to make sure the paint got into every crack and crevice. I knew I would go over it with several different washes, so I didn't worry so much about the difference between the color of the bark and the vines. With this undercoat done, it was time to move on to the details. In the woods near my house, I found some great examples of trees I used for reference. Every tree is going to be different, but the colors that I found most useful were olive green, Van Dyke brown, and white. For fine details like lichens, I used yellow ochre, sienna, and azio yellow. I dabbed a bit of paint in my palette and then using a stiff brush, stumped it until there was almost no color left. Then I worked to accentuate the texture using light swiping and sweeping. I found lighter greens to be really useful to build up mosses where the sun might reach them and a little bit of ochre was great to accent some lichen patches. The more colors I used, the more realistic it started seeming. Acrylic paints tend to darken as they dry, so I built up my texture slowly and came at it with many different passes. To try to help make the tree sit naturally into its environment, I used the same techniques and the same colors elsewhere throughout the terrarium. My idea was that if moss grew on the tree, it certainly would have grown on the background too, so I tried to put a bit of randomness and chaos everywhere. After a few short hours of dry brushing, I was really happy with my results. I was a little surprised with how much white I needed to use, but in the end, I felt like it looked pretty realistic. At this stage, my tree was basically ready to go, but I had to actually finish the terrarium as well as match up the edges before I could put it into place. And that gave me time to double check the electronics and make sure that everything worked. As I explained in part one of this video series, my goals for this tree were to make something that not only looked cool, but was also as fully functional as possible. So besides having the hide, of course there is the heat pad on the top and the light inside. If you're interested in learning more about the planning that went into this, from sandwiching the heat pad to choosing the LED light, check out video one in this series. But now it was time to connect all of the wiring, put the tree into place, and see if it all worked. And just like that, Willie was on top of it. It soon became Willie's favorite spot to hang out and just watch the world go by. The heating pad on top worked exactly as I wanted it to, and with the help of an IKEA smart outlet, I could control that temperature precisely, whether it was bringing it down at night or encouraging Willie to take up residence elsewhere. I was especially proud of the way that the tree felt like it harmonized with the rest of the terrarium. I wanted it to feel like it just grew there, and I think I achieved that. And the lights were great too. So my tree project was finally coming to an end. I tried a lot of new ideas along the way and came up with a number of different techniques that I hadn't seen before, but it was always in the context of trying to keep focused on my goals. And that was to make something that was not only functional, but also cool looking and something others could make as well. A lot of this was trial and error though, and maybe there are better ways to do it. I think if I were to do this again, I would just go ahead and mold it with probably a two-part epoxy clay or something like that. Because when you cover it with epoxy, you lose detail every time. The strength 
and the detail are kind of inverse related. So the stronger you want it, the less detail you're going to have. I learned so much making this tree, and I hope you enjoyed watching the video as much as I did putting it together. It's been so much fun learning from other people's experiences and incorporating that into what I do. So if you have any feedback or any comments, I'd love to hear from you. And if you enjoyed this video, I do appreciate it if you like it and subscribe, because I got tons of new videos and I'm putting them out as fast as I can. Building giant foam backgrounds, entire terrariums, waterfalls, even cool Wi-Fi cam projects. So stick around. See you soon.